life. Turn to the neighbor and say, fight for your life. How many of you here have ever felt like you were in a fight for your life? How many of you here have literally you fought for your life? All right. All right, well, I got a couple questions for you, and I want you to think about these, these answers as I ask. The first is this. Is the Christian life a life of peace, or is it a life of war? <laughs> is it a life of contentment, or is it a life on the ground? Is it a life of green pastures, or is it a life lived on the valley of the shadow of death? Is it a life of rest, or is it a life of toil? Is it a life of abundance, or a life of sacrifice? Is it a life of ease, or is it a life of conflict? What do you guys decide? What do you think? This is the quiet crowd, I forgot. Guess what? It's both. Turn to him and say, it's both. It's both. And while Jesus does offer to provide you peace, and he does offer to provide you contentment and rest, abundance and ease, he never promised you a life without a fight. How many of you say amen to that? Amen. Or ouch, right? He never promised you a life without a fight. In fact, the Christian life should not be seen as a comfort zone. Like you become a Christian and you expect to live life in a comfort zone. If anyone here has been a Christian for any amount of time, you know that the Christian life is not a comfort zone. It's a war zone. Can I get an amen? amen. The Christian life is not the little house on the prairie. The Christian house is the foxhole on the front line, in the trenches. Amen? amen. The Christian life is not a playground. It's a what? A battleground. Amen. You got the flow going. So we're here to talk about that today because sometimes we think that to be a Christian means that I'm sitting ringside eating popcorn watching the best fight. But the bottom line is that we're not sitting ringside. We're inside the fight and you're in the fight. Church him say you're in the fight. You're in the fight. Every day you wake up, you are thrust into the fight of your life. Can I get an amen? Every day that you wake up, whether you choose to lift your hands to defend yourself, whether you choose to lift your hands to parry the attacks, whether you use your hands to block, whether you use your hands to attack, whether or not you use your hands at all does not change the fact that whether you choose to use your hands, the fight is still coming to you. You are still in a fight. Now, some of you are like, yeah, I know. I had that fight this morning. My wife is the fight of my life. Or my husband and these kids, I created these monsters. This is the fight. Maybe you think you're fighting an illness. Maybe you think you're fighting a job or you're fighting a boss or you're, you're fighting something that's out of your control. I'm here to tell you that the fight of your life is not against those things. The fight of your life is told to you right there in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12. It says, for our struggle is not against the flesh and the blood, but it's against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. It's a spiritual fight. The fight is not your husband, the fight is not the kids, the fight is not your wife, the fight is not the ex. The fight is a spiritual fight. The Bible talks very clearly about this dark world that's happening. Every single day you wake up, you're thrust into a fight into this dark world. Amen? I watched a show, a series called Stranger Things. How many here have seen Stranger Things? Hey. I am man, Malachi, I see you. Shout out to Malachi, he saw Stranger Things. I saw Stranger Things, now listen, it's not a Christian program, it's on Netflix, but it does have some Christian themes, and one of the themes is this theme of the upside down. How many know what I'm talking about? And the upside down is a parallel world that seems like the real world, except it's much darker and it's much nastier and there's much more cloudy and evil lives in this upside down. And in this show, no one can see this upside down except this character named Will. Like, he, in, uh, in parts of the show, you see him, he blacks out and they don't know where he's at. He's like, and he's literally looking at the world from this upside down. In this scene, this is the end of the first season. He's just brushing his teeth, minding his business, just hanging out in his bathroom until all of a sudden he gets a glimpse of the upside down. And the upside down is a dark and nasty place. And I'm here to tell you that in your walk with God, you might think that all you see is buildings and all you see is people and all you see is the problems you have. But I'm here to tell you that behind what you see is an upside down world. It's a fallen world. It's a world of spiritual darkness. It's a world where the enemy is at. And that enemy is attacking you every single day from the upside down. 
Are you hearing me, church? Amen. I, I, I once was reading about the prophet Elisha in 2 Kings, and um, he, he, he had an army coming against him. And his servant starts freaking out, and his servant comes to him and says, wake up, there's an army coming, they're, they're approaching and they're going to kill us, and they're surrounding us everywhere, like, they are on their way. And Elisha, being the man of God that he was, he was able to see the upside down. He was able to see what was happening behind the scenes, and he prays to God, and he says, God, I pray that you would open the spiritual eyes of this guy right here. I pray that you would open the spiritual eyes of this man, and when he prayed that, the Bible says, that the guy's spiritual eyes opened up and he could see as he looked up on the hills surrounding him. He could see the hills filled with the chariots of God and the angels completely surrounding where they were camped out. And he said, you don't got to worry. Trust me, there's more of us than there are of them. Now, of course, with his natural eyes, when he looks, all he sees is him and Elisha. He's like, there's no way that we could fight this battle. But when he looked at it with those spiritual eyes, he saw this other world. And there is an other world out there, and trust me, whether you choose to believe it or not, that other world, that other enemy is fighting for you. And he's fighting against you, and every day you have an option to pick up your weapons and fight the fight for your life. So what is the fight of your life if it's not us, if it's not people? The fight for your life, write this down, is the fight for your faith. He wants to rob you of your faith. He wants to steal your faith. He wants to take away your faith. Apostle Paul, greatest apostle in the New Testament. He, he wrote most of the New Testament. He was mistreated. He was abused. He was stoned. He was whipped. He was wrongfully accused. He was arrested. At one point, he was even left for dead. They thought they had killed him and left him, and they just left his body. Until his team came by and they prayed for him and he got back up and he walked away. But he had suffered many, many atrocities. And toward the end of his life, he writes a letter to his, uh, his disciple Timothy. And he says this in 2 Timothy chapter 4. He says, I have fought the good fight. Somebody say, fight the good fight. Fight. I have finished the race. I have kept what? The faith. The faith. What is he saying? Listen, I have fought. I've reached the end. The goal of me fighting, the goal of me finishing the race was what? So that I could keep the faith. So he's saying, even though I was mistreated, I kept the faith. Even though I was wrongfully accused, I kept the faith. Even though everyone abandoned me, I kept the faith. Even though I was shipwrecked, I kept the faith. Even when I was stoned, I kept the faith. Even when I was left for dead, I kept the faith. And at the end of his life, he's able to proclaim with a surety, with a joy that he finished his race, that he fought a good fight. Why? Because at the end of it, he kept his faith. What is he saying? That this battle that I'm fighting, this toil that I'm up against, is out there to take my faith away. Jesus himself told us where this fight is coming from. In John chapter 10, verse 10, he says, the thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. But I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. The thief comes only. Underline that word only. I never paid attention to that word until this week. You know what that tells me? That the enemy, this thief, has only one motivation for you. That they all, he only has one mission against you. That there's only one thing that he cares about. The devil is not out there to be your friend. The devil is not out there to be your homeboy. He's not out there to provide you a better way. He's not out there to, to give you some things that will make you think that he's got a better deal than God. He's not out there so that you can join his team. He only has one motivation and one only, which is to steal, kill, and destroy you. Turn to your neighbor and say, neighbor, neighbor, the devil ain't your homeboy. <laughs> Jesus clearly states, hey, I'm here to bring you life and life in abundance, but you have an enemy, you have an adversary, someone is out to get you, to steal from you, to kill you, and to destroy you. There's someone out there. There's something out there, and it's out to get you. This word thief that Jesus used, this word is, the Greek word literally means an embezzler, a liar, a deceiver, a pilferer, someone. They use, they use this word to describe the false teachers of the time who would pretend to be your friend and pretend to want to bless you and pretend to want 
to be on your side and teach you things, but really they care nothing at all about you. They just want to take you and get in your good side so that they can abuse you for their own selfish gain. That's the word that Jesus is using here. And as I was preparing, the Lord showed me that there are some people in this church that you're being deceived by this thief. That you think he's your homeboy, but he ain't your homeboy. And you're being lied to, and the lies sound like this. Well, if I do this, no one's going to know. Or if I do this, then I'm not really hurting anybody. I mean, this is just me. I'm by myself. Or if I do this, then, you know, I'm, I'm not addicted like the other people. Or, or Lord, this is, I'm just doing it just this once. Or this is innocent fun. Or, or why the church is always trying to kill my flow? Like, why the church people always trying to blow my vibe? And you believe all those little lies, and, and you don't realize that it's the thief, and he's kind of working his way in there, but he ain't on your side. He wants to destroy you, and he wants to kill you. Now, what happens is because we don't feel the sting of our sin immediately, because we don't feel the burn of our sin on the spot, because it feels good on the spot, we risk our lives and we sleep with the enemy. How many have you seen sleeping with the enemy? We sleep with the enemy. But I'm here to tell you that you've got nothing to gain flirting with the devil than an STD. A sin transmitted death. You flirt with the devil, you go and sin, it brings to death. That's what the Bible says. That sin leads to death. It's the only thing you got when you flirt with him. The Bible says that he comes to steal, kill, destroy. That word destroy in the Greek literally means to put out of the way entirely, to abolish, to bring to an end, to ruin, to render someone useless. That's his goal for you. He's not there to provide you sweet options. He's there to destroy you. Now, how many of you here, raise your hands, would flirt or date someone you know that was out trying to kill you? <laughs> no, not enough crazy people in this room. How many of you here, you would go out of your way, you would actually date someone who had you on their hit list? You wouldn't? You're sitting in the date, you're eating your fried chicken, your steak, and you're like, so what do you like to do? And they're like, well, I just want to kill you. <laughs> Y'all laughing, but some of us, what we do is we go, you're stupid. <laughs> you're just playing, stop it. And he's like, no, I really just want to kill you. And you're like, but you seem so nice. And you seem so handsome. And you seem so pretty. Like, you, you ain't going to kill this. You want this. Yeah. And he's like, no, literally, you're on my hit list. You're next. How many of you would go on that date? Yeah. And, and why do we date the devil, right? Why do we entertain the enemy? Why do we entertain those temptations? Why do we entertain those things that we know are not good for us? If you wouldn't date, if you wouldn't sit yourself in that room with that person that's out to kill you, then with the devil, what you need to do is you need to put your foot down and say, check please. I'm out. As soon as you realize, hey, you out to get me, I'm out. Give me the check, put down the chicken, put down the steak. It's time to go. See you tomorrow. Don't flirt with him. But I'm here to tell you, if you won't date him, you have to fight him. Are you here what I'm talking about? If you don't date him, you have to fight him. There is no other option. He is not the type of date that you say, I don't want to date you no more, but you do you, I do me, and everything's good. You stay in your lane, I stay in my lane. As long as you don't bother me, I don't have no problem. No, he's not that type of date. He's a clingy date. He's the type that after you say no the first time, he don't get it through his thick head, he's gonna come back a second time. And he's gonna call you, and he's gonna blow up your phone until you change your number. You change your number, he's gonna pull up at your house. If you pull up at your house, he's gonna take pictures, he's gonna stalk you, he's gonna follow you to work, he's gonna look for you at the gym, he's gonna put you on his Snapchat even though you didn't even know he was recording you. Like, he's one of those. You're going to get a restraining order against him, and he's still going to come, and he don't care what the police say, he don't care what anybody say, he's going to stalk you, and he's going to keep stalking you until he kills you. So you cannot just say, I don't want to date anymore, devil. You got to fight. Turn to him and say, you got to fight. You got to fight. He's after your life. He's after your faith. The Bible says in 1 Peter 5, 8, 9, be sober, be 
vigilant because your adversary, your enemy, the devil, he walks about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. He's, his main role in life is to go around looking for people like you and me to swallow alive. He doesn't want to be a blessing to us. He wants to kill us and destroy us. So the Bible says, resist him. Steadfast in what? Faith. In faith. Because the one thing that he wants to steal from you is the thing that he knows could cause you to resist him. The thing that he's trying to steal from you is the only thing that he knows will keep him at bay. So he's trying to rob you of that faith. He's trying to kill your faith. He's trying to destroy your faith. And Paul says, and Peter says, resist him. Steadfast in your faith. You got to fight. Turn to him and say, I got to fight. Write this down. You got to fight because the stakes are high. First thing, write it down. Fight because the stakes are high. Your family, your friends, your loved ones depend on your faith. The people at work, they look to you, they know you're a Christian, they're depending on you whether you know it or not. The kids that you have that look up to you, they're depending on you and your faith whether you know it or not. Your loved ones around you, they're depending on your faith whether you know it or not. And the stakes are high, your walk with God depends on it. Your walk with God depends on whether or not you keep that faith going. The enemy wants to take your purity. He wants to take your standards. He wants to take your morals, your strength. He wants to even take the blessing that comes from knowing God and the blessing that comes from serving God. He wants to steal it all. Look what Jesus told Peter in Luke 22. He says, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan demanded to have you. He asked permission to torment you, to take you and trample you and kill you and destroy you. And when it says you in the Greek, literally, it wasn't just Peter that Jesus was talking about. And I know none of us have ever sifted wheat, at least that I know of, right? But she's like, yeah, I did. Back in the day, right? In Bible times, in order for you to sift wheat after you, you pluck it out of the ground, it came the wheat kernels and the grain came wrapped up in a stalk and whatever. You literally had to beat this, this reed. You had to trample upon these stalks and upon these, these grains. And, and you bring your oxen and, you, and all the animals and they crush it. And, and you tread it and you slap it and scrape it and beat it up. And after it gets all beat up, they throw it in the air. And then the wind blows away the chaff and the grain falls. And he's saying, Peter, Satan has asked that he could beat you up and tear you down and trample you underfoot and destroy you. But I have prayed what? That your faith may not fail. Why? Because he's after the faith. The fight of your life is the fight for your faith. Satan wants to destroy you and destroy your faith. But how many of you thank God that Jesus is praying for our faith? That it won't fail. How many of you don't want to fail? I don't want to fail. You want to fail? We don't want to fail. So we got to fight because the stakes are high. Eternity is on the line. Answer this question. What's worse than losing your faith in God? What's worse than that? There's nothing worse than that. Why? Because eternity is on the line. Where you spend eternity is on the line. The Bible says in Mark 8.36, what good is it for someone to gain the whole entire world and yet they lose their soul? Which means you can get all the money in the world, all the riches, all the rewards, all the awards, all the accolades, all the magazine articles, people talking about you. You can have your name on buildings and you could be world famous. What good is all of that stuff here on this earth for this little while if at the end of it you still lose your soul? So we gotta fight for our faith because the stakes are high. Second thing we gotta do is we gotta fight the right way. Write that down. Fight the right way. Supernatural enemies require supernatural weapons. Supernatural weapons. Now going back to the show stranger thing, right? So now he so now we see um we see that that this whole a uh, uh, culminating thing of the upside down being real and affecting the real world and what happens in the real world we finally see the team come together and they believe it and and that enemy traverse he pretty much came from the upside down into the real world now and now they can all see it and now they all want to fight it and there's one kid in the show his name is Lucas right Lucas 
He's like, you know what, I got my wrist rocket, right? The wrist rocket is a slingshot, you know, it sits on your wrist to give you more power. And at the end of the show, they see the demigorgon, they see the monster coming, and he pulls out, he's like, don't pull out the wrist rocket, pull out the rocks, pull out the rocks. They go crazy scrambling to pull out the rocks and to pull out the wrist rocket. He pulls it out, and he hits the, the, the monster, and the monster's like, and the monster keeps coming. And he pulls out a second rock, and he pops the monster, and the monster keeps coming. And then the third one, yes, of course, slow motion TV, right? He hits the monster and noise you. The monster slams back. Now he's like, yeah, my wrist rocket. But he didn't know it wasn't the wrist rocket. What happened was behind him there was the supernatural power. The kid L with the supernatural abilities. He came and she said, Hadouken, and knocked him all the way back to the wall. She hit him with the M1, like bang, like boy. And he just said, Hadouken, and he fell back to the wall. He thought it was the wrist rocket, but I'm here to tell you, you can't fight the devil with a wrist rocket. You can't fight a supernatural force in normal means, which means you can't argue your way out of this problem. You can't curse your way out of other people's problems, and, and you can't curse the boss out, and, and you can't try to fight and go to the union, and all that stuff is good, but none of that stuff works. Why? Because you're in a spiritual fight, and it requires spiritual weapons. Amen? As a child of God, you have access to a super spiritual military arsenal. Are you hearing me? You have access to a super spiritual military grade arsenal that's used to kill super spiritual enemies. Amen? And all we got to do is access the army. I'm going to tell you that when you became a child of God, you were given an all access pass that when you walk into the army, you say, bing, bing, that door opens up and you have access to weapons that you didn't normally have access to. Jesus Christ gave you that access when he died on the cross for you. And, that, and part of that, that being able to walk in and access those weapons is so that you can fight the good fight. Amen? The first weapon is this, prayer. Why is it so quiet? Like, you're like, oh, oh yeah, I do that, prayer. <laughs> we gotta pray, people. Turn to the we gotta pray. What does the Bible say about prayer? Philippians 4, 6. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. John 15, 7. If you abide in me, and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. Come on, it will be done for you. Mark 11, 24. Therefore I tell you, whatever you ask in prayer, believe that you have received it, and it will be yours. yours. Whatever you ask for in prayer, believe that you have received it, and it will be yours. How come we don't do this? How come we're not praying this? How come we're not coming to God and saying, God, I believe this. This is what I want. I'm going to ask you for this, and I'm going to believe that I receive it, and it shall be mine. Luke 11, 9 says, and I tell you, ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be open to you. These are the things that we have access to through prayer. Can somebody say amen? amen. So stop making prayer your last option and make prayer your first resort. Make it be the first thing that you go to in every situation, in every request, in every fight, in every battle, whether it's a battle for your own sanity, whether it's a battle for your children, or it's a battle with your spouse, or it's a battle at the job, that the first thing you do before you curse anybody out, before you speak ill about anybody, before you gossip, before you moan, before you complain, the first thing should be to come to God. Listen, church, you are living under your level of privilege and you are living under your level of authority you are living under your level of access when you neglect prayer hmm. you know what i'm saying think about the president barack obama he had two kids right two yeah got two girls you think those girls walked around the white house like man it would be real nice to have some chocolate cake no i don't want to ask because we might not have or i don't want to ask because you know I don't know, I just feel funny asking. No! When those girls want chocolate cake, they say, I want chocolate cake, and chocolate cake showed up. They got a whole, a whole entire kitchen at their disposal. She said, I want steak, steak was there. And she want a shake, shake is there. So if she said, I want cake, shake, and a steak, it's there. <laughs> because she is the child of the President of the United States, and she is living according to her access. Amen. Living according to the level of her privilege. If I go home and I 
I say, honey, I want a shake, a steak, and a cake. <laughs> She's gonna be like, here's a box, here's some chicken, shake and bake. <laughs> Not at that level of access yet. Sometimes I gotta eat what we got. But if you are not tapping into prayer, you're saying, God, you gave me the privilege, but I'm not going to use it yet. It's like, I have all these weapons, but uh, I'm not too sure. Should I really take them, God? Should I, should I ask you for them, God? Like, maybe I just go and slap the devil a little bit. No! <laughs> you got to use the weapons that you have at your access. The second weapon is this, is the Bible. Nine out of ten households have a Bible. Somebody say amen to that. Amen. Nine out of ten households in America have a Bible. However, more than half of Americans have read little or none of the Bible. That's crazy, right? There's a Bible everywhere, but nobody wants to read it. Ouch. Only about 22% of Americans read a little bit of the Bible each day in a systematic way, which means less than 23% than of people actually have a plan for reading their Bible. And I'm not gonna ask you to raise your hands to see who has a plan to read their Bible, but this is God speaking. So we all need to create a plan to read your Bible. It's essential. Don't just leave it sitting in the nightstand. Don't leave it sitting in the chinero. Don't just leave it in the house collecting dust. You have it for a reason. The Bible says in 2 Timothy 3.16 that all scripture is breathed out by God and is profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training for righteousness and in righteousness. Amen? Hebrews 4.12 says, For the word of God is living and active, sharper than what? Than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and of spirit, of joints and of marrow, and discerning the thoughts and the intentions of the heart. John 6.63 6, says, It is the spirit who gives life. The flesh is no help at all. The things that I can do in the flesh to solve my problems and to fight these battles are of no help at all. Whining about things doesn't help at all and crying about things doesn't help at all and, and, and moping and, and looking for Dr. Phil and Oprah and all these people to fix my problems is no help at all. But it says the spirit gives you life. And then what else does he say? He says the words that I have spoken to you are spirit and life. Jesus is saying everything that I have spoken, all my words that I give to you, those are spirit and life. And that is what's going to get you through this fight. Can somebody say amen? amen? If you don't believe that, Ephesians chapter 6, 17 is very simple. It says the sword of the spirit is the word of God. Do you know that in Ephesians chapter 6, uh, the apostle Paul talks about the full armor of God and everything that we should be putting on every day. And he talks about a helmet, and he talks about a chest plate, and he talks about a belt, and he talks about shoes, and, and, he, and we're all girded up and ready to fight this fight. But the only thing that he gave us to attack is the word of God. It's the sword of the spirit. That's the only weapon that you were given to fight the enemy and fight the good fight for your faith. So to neglect your weapon and to leave your Bible in a closet somewhere for weeks at a time. Battle, this guy, he is the worst of the worst that I have ever met. And this person and this job and this situation. However, the Bible says that my God will not put on me any more than I can handle. And I can handle this as long as I have God with me. And you walk through your life and you say, I can handle it. And when my car breaks down, I can handle it. And when I get into that argument, I can handle it. And when my friends start to pressure me and peer pressure me into doing something I don't want to do, I can't handle it because my word says that God is not going to put anything more than I can handle. That's what it means to come in agreement with the word of God. So when Romans 8 says that you are more than a conqueror through Christ who loved you, and you walk around having pity parties and sad about what you're going through and you feel defeated, then you're not walking in agreement with God's word. Walking in agreement with God's word says, not only, not only am I going through this and it's tough and it's difficult, but I am a conqueror and not just a conqueror, but I am more than a conqueror. Another version says that I have overwhelming victory over my life and over my problems and I'm gonna walk as someone who has overwhelming victory. Am I gonna keep my head down? And no, I'm going to keep my head up because my God made me more than a conqueror through him who loves me. Christ loves me and he's got my back 
and he's going to cover me, and he's going to watch me, and he's going to take care of me, and I can leave my kids in his hands, I can leave my job in his hands, I can leave my marriage in his hands, I can leave it all in his hands, because he loves me, and because he loves me, I'm more than a conqueror. This situation will not beat me. So when it says in Philippians 4.13 that I can do all things through my God who strengthens me, it means when I'm faced with an obstacle, I don't whimper away, but I say I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And I'm going to walk and know that I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. So it means to walk in agreement with the word. But church, you're never going to walk in agreement with the word if you don't know it. Huh. If you don't read it, if you don't study it, if it just sits there. I like what the Bible Gateway is doing right now, uh, the, 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 the Holy Bible app, right? Yeah. Through Life Church. If, if they have this thing now, I know the kids like doing streaks on Snapchat. Like, the, some kid literally live for streaks. Like, you take their phone away, you punish them, and you block their streaks, they're having a meltdown. Like, streaks means. I send you a message today, you send me one tomorrow, I send you one the next day, and we keep that streak going, and the, the longer we do it, the higher our streak count goes, right? And if you got 100, 200 streak count, you're a boss, like, oh, you made it. Like, you streaky, like, I, I don't even know. So they got this thing now in the Bible thing where each day you log in to read your Bible, it counts it as a streak. In case that motivates you to keep your Bible reading going, you want to challenge your brethren, you want to challenge your sister or brother in Christ, yo, I'm on 7th Street, oh, I'm on 12th Street, oh, I'm on 15th Street. It's just another thing that they're doing. Why? Because reading the Bible is so important. It's so necessary. And we will find whatever methods, whatever means, whatever sermon we've got to preach to get you to understand that it is one of your greatest weapons and you cannot leave it sitting in your home unused. Are you listening to me, church? Yeah. Amen. And then the last point, we're going to fight together. Somebody say fight together. Fight together. Woo! I had a cousin named Joey. Well, he's still alive. He is Joey. He's still my cousin. And when me and Joey were growing up, he was about a year or two younger than me. But me and Joey were like ride or die bros. Like, you ever had one of those that like, y'all do everything together. You have the sleepovers. Like, everything was just it's me and this guy against the world, right? Anyone ever had a friend like that? Nobody ever had Giuseppe yet. So, you know, me and Joey were like best bud, bro. I was in his house all the time. And then one day, we in the hood in Kelly Street, in the South Bronx, into Bill Avenue. And, and I was outside, and I think we were playing Skelly, whatever, and I had beat some kids. Skelly, or Skelly. And I had beat some kids, and they got angry. And this kid named Michael, like, he, he looked like a literal little Mike Tyson. He was a scary young man. And he was talking about me, blah, 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 and he was egging me on because he wanted to fight. And I, was, I knew he was going to beat me up, so I didn't try it. And then I'm sitting on the stoop, and Michael comes and he pops me right inside of my face. And then they're like, and I'm talking about a skinny little thing, and I start going crazy. Michael sees me freaking out. He's like, he's like, He's trying to dodge me, I'm trying to get him. He picks up a broomstick and he starts popping me in the head. Raka, raka. The broomstick breaks on my head. But I'm on an adrenaline high, so I don't feel it. And I'm chasing him, and then I see Michael's friends coming, because Michael's friends saw I was about to go crazy on Michael. And now I'm like, oh, I'm about to get jumped. I'm about to get jumped. And I'm looking for my cousin, and I'm like, Joey! I see Joey coming, from my left side of my eye, I see him. And Joey got this chain, at the end of the chain there's a ball on it. It was part of some toy that he used to swing yeah. and knock the bowling pins down. He must have ripped that thing off. And he came and like, yeah. And I'm like, yeah, Joey! And then Joey showed up and he's like, whoa, whoa, whoa. And then everybody running and I'm like, yeah! We chased Michael and his boy out the block. Me and Joey, fighting together. Even though I was bleeding. Listen, when we have no clue who we're fighting or what we're fighting, we end up fighting each other. We end up fighting each other. Even in the church, believers, we might not consciously know it, but we're at war with other believers. 
And when we compare ourselves to other believers, we're at war with them even though we don't know it. And when we start comparing our successes to the, oh, how come they're so successful and I'm not? And we start looking at the brother's blessings. How come I don't got those blessings? And how come I don't got this? And how come I don't got that? Or, or when we show up to church and we try to be and appear impressive to other brethren, like my brother, praise God, and we start dropping all the Bible verses you know in one shot, trying to look like you a certain type of Christian when you know deep down you're inside you're a mess. And rather than seeking that brother's help, you're trying to impress someone else. When we hide how much help we truly need from one another. When we come in here and we put on a mask and we put on a facade like everything is hunky-dory and the Lord is good all the time and we, we don't, none of us have fights because we're here and everybody feels good when you know deep down inside you're a mess and you need one of your brothers to lift you up out of that pit and you need one of your sisters to pray over you through that situation and you need the encouragement of other people. We avoid that interaction and we pretend like everything is good. And what we're doing is unknowingly We've adopted the crooked mindset of the world that says it's a dog-eat-dog -dog world and if I don't want to look weak out there, I'm definitely not going to look weak in here. I'm going to come with my game face on, I'm going to walk this Christian walk and talk the talk and let everybody believe that I got it all together. But we're broken. And when we get broken, we start to, to as believers, we start to gossip and we start to cast judgment on other believers. And we start to, to have thoughts about other believers and shaming people in our minds. Like, how dare they do that? How dare they say that? How dare they sit there, wear that, do this, do that? And we got this war going on on the inside. I believe that, that more Christians these days have been killed in the line of fire by, by friendly fire rather than the, the devil himself. Ask somebody you know who's not in this church right now, somebody at your job, somebody in your neighborhood, about their experience with church. And what you'll find is that they'll say, man, I went to the church and I got burned. I got judged. I got this. I got that. And what they're doing is they're going down by friendly fire. When we are not the enemy, we have the same enemy. Jesus told us we have the same enemy. There's a thief that's coming to steal, kill, and destroy you. And he's coming to steal, kill, and destroy me. And what sense of it is to join his team if, if that's his main motivation? So as brothers and sisters, we got to stand together and fight together. Put down the mask. Put down the lies. Put that all to the side. Nobody cares how holy you are. We want to know where's your health, where's your walk with God, and how can I help you get better? That's what it's all about. Nobody got to think the fun. We're all fighting the same battle. We're fighting the same enemy. Jesus himself said that a house divided against itself cannot stand. If we keep fighting each other, instead of fighting the real enemy, we're going to drop. We're going to lose this war. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 10 that the weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. We, somebody say we. We, we demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And we take captive every thought and make it obedient to Christ. It's something that we do for each other. Tear down all those arguments, tear down all those lies, all those precepts, all those pretensions, all those things that we're pretending to be and be real so that we can get healed. Amen. Proverbs 27, 17 says, as iron sharpens iron, one man sharpens another. It is your role and your responsibility as a child of God to sharpen me. And it is my role and responsibility to sharpen you. And the role and the responsibility of the person next to you is to sharpen you and you to sharpen them. Why are we fighting each other when we should be fighting the same enemy? The Bible, you know, you know in the New Testament, how many times the phrase one another is said? One another, like love one another, bless one another, share with one another, care for one another. 100 times in the New Testament, the words one another appear. Why? Because we're not fighting each other. Together, we fight the enemy. Don't fake the funk with it. And anyone here, you look up to anyone here, don't fake the funk with them. Be real. Be 
what you were, what, if you go through something, let us know. This is a place where real relationships happen. Nobody's gonna judge you. I've been through some things. I am not the one to judge. You feel me? How many here have been through some things? How many here is the one to judge? Nobody. You came to the right place, but we gotta fight together. Somebody say amen. Because Matthew 18, 20 says this. For where two or three are gathered in my name, there am I among them. Why is it when you don't know? If you by yourself, you, this verse don't apply to you. But what is Jesus saying, man? When you link up with another brother, you link up with another sister, you link up in groups, two, three, and you link up in your small group, and you start fighting together. When you are together, I show up. Turn to the next day, he's gonna show up. When we link up. No, no. Oh, you don't want to say that part? <laughs> say, he gonna show up. He gonna show up. When we link up. When we link up. No, turn to your neighbor. Don't say it to me. I got enough links. Turn to your neighbor and say, he's gonna show up. He's gonna show up. When we link up. <laughs> How many believe God's word? Amen. Let's come in agreement with this God's word. Amen. God bless you. Stand to your feet. And let me send you with the blessing all night. Yes. <laughs> let's, let's just pray. Let's start with that. Close your eyes right where you are. Lift up your hands to the Lord. How many are ready to fight? If you're not ready yet, it's because you don't believe the stakes are high. And you still think you could finagle your way or make deals with the enemy and, and wiggle your way out of what God is calling you to do. But God's word is so clear today. He's calling us all to fight. To fight for our faith, to fight the good fight, to finish our race so that at the end we can look back and say, Lord, I have kept the faith. I have kept my trust in you. I have kept my dependence on you. I'm still completely surrendered to you. I have not let my insecurities take over. I have not let my fear take over, God. I have not let these arguments take over, this anger take over, this hatred take over, this unforgiveness. God, I have not let any of that take over. I have kept the faith. And if you're here today, I pray that even right now, God would ignite inside of you the spirit of a fighter, the spirit of a warrior, someone who recognizes that the battle is at hand that the enemy is real and he's coming your way. I pray, Lord Jesus, that all around this room you would equip your saints, oh Father God, with the full armor of God. From head to toe, with the helmet of salvation, Father God, with the breastplate of righteousness, Lord, that they would have the belt of truth buckled around their waist, that their feet would be ready with the gospel of all season, in season and out of season, Lord, prepare your soldiers for the fight. I pray, oh Father God, that they would carry with them the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, that they would wield it and use it, my God, that they would not just put it to the side and pretend they don't need it, Father, but that they would utilize it, oh Father God. God, as the weapon that you have given them for this spiritual warfare, oh Father. I pray, Father, for every single child in here, Lord, that not one of them will live under their privilege anymore, that not one of them will live under their authority anymore, oh God. For those who have put prayer to the side, those who have said, I don't have time, I don't have the energy, it's been a busy day, God, I'll pray tomorrow, God, I'll pray next week. Those who have been going through a spiritual drought and haven't talked to you in weeks or months, oh God. I pray that even right now, you would reignite the flame and a passion to fellowship with you, O oh God, to meet with you on the daily, O oh Lord, and seek from you, O oh God, the strength they need to fight the good fight of faith. Here right now, lift your hands and say, Lord, that's what I want. I come in agreement with that word right now. Lord, say, just say amen, amen. That's what I want. That's what I need, God. I want that fire. Lord, I want to fight for you, God. Lord, I want that burning on the inside of me, Lord Jesus. Father God, I come agree with your word, Lord Jesus. I want to be able to fight the right way, oh God. And I want to fight together, Lord. I'm not going to keep keeping myself away from everybody, Lord. And pretending.
feeling like everything is okay. Okay, God, I'm going to seek you, Lord. I'm going to find your body. I'm going to find your people, Lord. I'm going to connect with them where they're connecting, oh God. And I'm going to link up so you can show up, oh Father God. I'm going to seek them, Lord. I'm going to confess my sins, oh God. I'm going to get my healing through the fellowship with the saints, oh Father. I'm going to link up arm in arm in the greatest army, oh Father God, that has ever existed, the army of the living God. And I'm going to fight this good fight of faith to the very end. If that's what you want, say yes, Lord. Amen. I agree. I come into agreement right now with that word. I receive that right now, Father. I want to link on to Father God with my brethren, Lord Jesus, so that you can show up and move in a marvelous way. And if you're here today, and your biggest problem is that you don't even know Jesus, but you know that you've been in a battle. You know that you've been in struggle. You know that it's been war for you. And you haven't had the power. You haven't had anything inside you that you needed to make these things go away. I'm here to tell you that they might never go away, but Christ is here to give you the power to get over them. Christ is here to give you the power to have overwhelming victory over the enemy in your life. And if you've never tapped into any of that power and you want Jesus Christ today to be your Lord, to be your Savior, to be your provider, to be your comforter, to be everything you need, to be your Prince of Peace, to, to be everything He said He is. Then it's as simple as praying a simple prayer saying, Lord, I, I know I'm a mess, I've blown it, God, and I want to start new in you. I want you to give me new life. If you're here today and you want to pray that prayer, the whole church is going to join you because we are one army and we stand in solidarity with you, Father God. We stand in solidarity with everyone here. And the prayer goes like this. Say, Lord Jesus, I ask right now that you would forgive me of my sin. All of my sin, God. I know I've blown it. But I believe that you died in the cross for me. And you didn't stay there. You rose again. And I receive new life through you. I thank you, Father, that you have called me into your army. And I will fight the good fight of faith. In your mighty name.